Right, now we can go. Okay, so um, I can't thank you for inviting me because I kind of invited myself to help fill a slot. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a talk that I've um, given, I think it's about the eighth time it's been done. Um, sometimes to uh, radio clubs and a, an engineering club and a couple of local groups that are non-radio that just want so it's not a, a heavily it's not a technical article it's a thing it's more of a just a bit of romps with a bit of history um and so the nice badge down the bottom the gw4 tta that's the dragon amateur radio cover which i'm a member uh, which um brian was showing that nice bit of slate with it with it engraved on so that's so i'm based up in north wales anyway let's see if this is going to work come on now slides well just just leave that on screen for a quick second uh Simon. Yeah, I'm, I'm waiting. <clears throat> I've got to see if it'll actually move. It's having a, a wobbly. You know what Facebook's like when you try and things when you're trying to do too many things at once. Ah, okay. Right, right so it's uh, the birth of broadcasting, or I say it's a, you know, a collection of odd bits of equipment, uh, a newspaper magnet, um, an Australian singer, an ex Royal Flying Corps captain, and a, a group of radio amateurs helped to create um, broadcasting in the UK. So there's four sort of items in that picture, and they all have a, a significant um, importance in the very first advertised broadcast in the UK. I'm sure some of you know that know what the answer is. If anyone does know, just shout up. You don't have to tell me what the answer is, but no, oh good. <laughs> so we've got a telephone, we've got knicker elastic, um, a hat stand and a, a cigar box. Not the cigars, but the box is the important bit. Well, I'm not gonna tell you how a radio, an AM transmitter works. You all know it, but I always put that in for if you're trying to talk to an audience that uh, hasn't ever touched radio, you, you try and give a brief explanation of how it uh, comes together. So before we go into what's happening in the UK, let's just have a quick look at what was happening in the US. We could look at anywhere in Europe, it's just that um, I was looking, at, I was reading about Fessenden at the time, the Canadian chap, well, born in Canada, um, working for the National Electric Signaling Company. Uh, he was um, also working on trying to get uh, transatlantic uh, communications set up with wireless, uh, sort of trying to rival Marconi. Um, but Marconi did pip him to the post on that one, certainly got there first. Now, he did try this at first in, the, in, the, in Canada, trying to get them interested, but the Canadian government was not remotely interested. So he moved to um, the US and in 1902 set up the National Le Electric Signaling signaling company it was quite a serious gentleman and two financiers from pittsburgh helped him uh, set up the company so in branch rock uh, massachusetts um part of the um, national electronic signaling company's uh, transatlantic setup which is what we can see in bottom right there struggling to compete with the marconi however on the 24th of november 1906, so Christmas Eve 1906, it's claimed that Fessenden at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um, gave the very first, what you would consider in modern terms, a broadcast. Not just a test transmission of voice, but with some music, etc. What did it consist of? Um, he played um, an Edison phonograph, a recording of Handel's Largo, the aria. He read verses from the gospel according to St. Luke and gave a violin solo. And you can see he's in his, um, that's in theory the um, part of the, the station set up there and you can see his violin. And he apparently finished off by wishing everyone a Merry Christmas and who wouldn't on Christmas Eve. However, there was nothing recorded to confirm this had happened until about 20 years later in his own memoirs that was written saying that this, this broadcast, there's no contemporary account from the time that says this happened. 
So I've got no real reason to doubt it. I'm sure he did. Um, I mean, I don't know what other people might think, but I'm sure that uh, this, uh, Mr. Fessenden did make this broadcast in November 1906. But I find it very strange that it took 20 years before anything to be recorded about it in the press or in any type of media. Because if something new happens, usually the press would catch up on it, wouldn't they? So I've always had a slight doubt as to whether, whether this happened, but that's probably just me being cynical. Uh, we're now going to start looking at the rise of the Marconi Company. And Signor Marconi was someone who did not shy away from, from uh, promoting his work. So if Marconi was the first to do this, we'd have known about it in the press. So this just builds up to the birth of broadcasting. So we need to sort of work out, certainly in the UK, what's going on. At the rise of the Marconi, uh, Marconi Company. So in 1896, Marconi sort of came over here first to the UK uh, with his fledgling um, wireless and telegraph company, which was set up in 1898. Now, Marconi, when he first came across the UK, was struggling to get any interest in his um, invention or his work. And it was actually someone from North Wales, from Carnarvon. Uh, the town of Carnarvon in North Wales, so just well near enough Brian. Brian, who's on, is nearest to Carnarvon, aren't you, Brian? He's, he's probably nodding. Um, gentleman who lived there called William Priest was the chief engineer for the post office at the, at the time, the, uh, the Royal Mail, the post office. And the post office in the UK uh, was responsible for not only the, the mail, the post, but also for the telephones. And in time, they were also responsible for telecommunications for the licensing thereof, etc., And it was actually William Priest who also had an interest in the potential of radio communications, first um, helped the, the young Marconi to meet various people from the government, the, the armed forces, etc. So anyway, 1898, the business is still struggling, but they, they purchased this works, the Hall Street Works, um, which was an old silk works, working with silk, in, in the town of Chelmsford in Essex. The building's still there. Um, but uh, two years in, so 1898, you're two years into the business. And despite many successful demonstrations of his apparatus for transmitting and receiving um, Spark, but for CW, with, you know, Morse code with Spark, he'd yet to make any sales of his equipment. And to keep the company going, he spent a lot of his time making bits for telephones, etc., all that kind of telecommunications um, bits and pieces. However, he was still teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. Um, but it was by 1899, this, they actually, sorry, it was 1899, they got the Hall Street, these works here. And I said they were doing a lot of subcontracting. But as we know with Marconi, all of a sudden, in, in a short, very short space of time, the company took off and with some war use and things like that, it started to be used. Does anyone recognize the gentleman uh, on the left hand side? Does anyone like to tell me who it is to take the let put your mic on? Baden Powell, yeah, Baden Powell. Yes, a couple of people there, Lord uh, Robert Stevenson Smythe Baden Powell, who, for those who don't know, was the uh, gentleman that founded the scouts, the scouting movement for Boy Scouts, and then we have girls in, in the in the well, he was the, the World Scout um, chief of uh, chief scout of the world. But before that, he had quite a successful uh, military career, and uh, particularly was in the Boer War, um, when the um, African Boer colonies of South Africa, South African Republic of the Transvaal and the Orange Free State were um, trying to break out from. Britain and you know effectively. Now strangely enough during this and uh, of course there was a siege at a place called Mafeking as well where they kept going for months which uh, sieges seem to be all of the rage at the moment unfortunately. Um, Marconi actually supplied primitive wireless equipment to both sides in this war. Um, just a simple spark sets and you know the coherer is some sort of receiver, primitive but effective over the sort of range they were using them. Um, 
So that's another, that was one aspect. Then in 1900, you had something called the Chinese Boxer Re Rebellion. Um, the Boxers, as we called them, was a, a secret organization and known as the Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fists. Fists. Um, and they sort of led an uprising against the, the Western influences in, in, in Japan. Oh, sorry, the Western and Japanese influence in China. Let's get that correct. They, they, they were known as boxers because they performed physical exercises. And um, by doing these physical exercises, these boxers, this, this, these boxers um, believed that they would become impervious to bullets, which completely crackers, <laughs> but that's what they believed. Um, from June to August, the boxers uh, of 1900, the boxers besieged the um, foreign district of Beijing, which was then called Peking in China's capital until an international force that included American troops sub subdued the uprising. Um, and by the end of it, the terms of the Boxer, Boxer Protocol ended um, the, the rebellion and China had to pay more than $330 million in reparations. And that was in 1900. I mean, what would 330 million be worth today? You know, from 1900. Once again, the Marconi equipment was used. Um, some of which the boxers managed to steal off the British and use themselves. So they might think they were impervious to bullets and being slightly crackers, but they could work out how to use the spark transmitter. So you could see that Marconi's starting to sell a little bit of equipment, not in any great number. The 8th of May, the Royal Navy are finally persuaded to try some of this equipment and ordered 32 wireless sets in 1901. And by 1905, there was 108 ships fitted with Marconi equipment. Of course, 1901 was also a big year because that's the year that um, Marconi bridges the Atlantic between Poldo in Cornwall and St. John's Newfoundland, sending the letter, was it the letter S, I believe, uh, in Morse at the prearranged time. And he claimed that he'd heard it in the static. Did he hear it? Or again, was there a little bit was there a little bit of Marconi um, being slightly liberal with the truth at that point with the very primitive equipment that he was using, and whichever was true, the newspapers were full of this amazing feat of, of communications um, magic, bridging the Atlantic, and uh, from that moment on, Marconi's future was set. You always have to remember that, was it the night before the, um, was it around about the, the 11th of December that the receiving antennas at um, Newfoundland all collapsed under a, a huge storm. And um, they, they resulted to using a, a, a long wire a receiving antenna, which was held up by a kite. And I'm sure you all know that, but do you know who, uh, Richard, Richard, Mr. Dismore, he might know this. Do you know who designed the kite that they used to lift the antenna? Or the aerial. You're on um, you're on mute, uh, Richard. Let's see if he knows. Right. Was it, was it uh, Lindbergh? Not quite. No. It was Baden Powell. Oh, was it? It was a Baden Powell oh. levitator, which he designed in, in large form to lift um, a scout, not a boy scout, but like a military scout, to, up high so they could um, spy on enemy enemy positions. Oh boy! You know, being lifted by a kite. It was a, it was a quite a big kite. It wouldn't have been much fun. <laughs> Imagine that. You know, being spotted by um, the boars or whatever, and being shot at because you're up there on a bit of bit of fabric being held oh. aloft. But uh, anyway, so 1901. Whatever the case with the 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 signal across the Atlantic, was it the letter S or was it QRN that he's he's holding out hope and imagines he's heard it, you know what it's like when you're calling, you're waiting for that weak CW signal or that voice signal, and I'm, I'm sure he's coming back to me. Has he come back to me? I can't quite hear. Um, but the publicity that Marconi got was brilliant. Okay, a couple more notable events of the, um, the, the equipment manufactured at Hall Street, this old silk works. And um, we all know the Titanic was sunk in 1912, the unsinkable after its collision with the iceberg. And the use of the uh, CQD, Come Quickly Danger, and the SOS um, summon the signal, summon the Carpathia. Um, 
730 lives were saved because of wire, the wireless. We all know that, you know, hundreds more perished. But you could argue that the rest of them would have been out on those, could have been out on those dinghies for some time and more perished because of the cold, etc. So wireless had its first real rescue. And the same in 1915, uh, the RMS Lusitania was torpedoed by a German U-boat. And another 760 people were saved because of wireless. And all of these events just helped build this cult or, or build the reputation of Marconi. And this company just continues to grow. So there's um, Jack, well, there's John George Phillips, who's known as Jack, who was 25 years of age at the time that the Titanic sank. And we've all seen this before. He wasn't a, he wasn't a White Star Lines employee. If you look at the cap badge, it's M for Marconi. So not only did Marconi um, sell the equipment to all these different ships of the line, etc., and at this point, including the Royal Navy, but he also put his own men on the vessels who were trained and paid for by Marconi. So the, the, the White Star Line were paying a handsome price to have wire, not only the equipment, but also the operators there. So he really cornered the market. He sold the equipment and he also, um, you know, charged for the personnel. Um, but that primitive equipment there, and um, we're not going to go into it, really did a good job. So this is where we come to an end of an era. Uh, by 1912, the, the production at Hall Street, had be, it had become too small for the demand of the production. So we'd gone from 1898, 1899, where he wasn't, 1899, wasn't it, where they were doing piecework for, you know, making telephone components and, and subcontract work. So by 1912, the place is too small. So it, it closed as a production facility, but they replaced it, all due to the popularity of his equipment. Was it the end of Hall Street? No, it wasn't. Um, Part of the site was used as a Y station, a listening station in the First World War until, well, until midway through in 1916. And that information was fed back to the Admiralty building, you can see below, to room 40 and the code breaking team there at the Admiralty. And they were intercepting a lot of signals from the German fleet. Um, and it was the code breakers at the Admiralty in the First World War. And of course, by the second, we'd be thinking that Bletchley Park would be doing a very similar job, but a lot more sophisticated. So they're leaving Hall Street in Chelmsford, but where do they go? Well, they stay in Chelmsford. And they build the very first purpose-built wireless factory in the world. Uh, it lasted for 100 years until 2012. But what I find amazing is from the conception, the idea of we need a new building. They bought, they purchased the land. They had the design created and it all built, constructed every last brick of the originals, completed in 17 weeks. <laughs> you wouldn't even, I mean, if, imagine you've got the land and imagine you've got the planning, you know, the, the, the plans drawn. It would take more than 17 weeks to get to a planning committee in the UK now. <laughs> in fact, if, if you're looking at, you know, a lot of major developments, it could take a, a year or two because there's always the complaints and, you know, various revisions. But there it was, 17 weeks, and they spent 48 hours. All the staff uh, were told that one weekend in June 1912, um, they, did, they weren't to have a weekend off. They were going to work straight through. And in 48 hours, they transferred production. And on the Monday morning, they were busy as before, as they were in Hall Street, but working in a much bigger factory. Um, so you've got to admire the spirit of that age of just... We're going to do it, we're doing it. No ifs, no buts, let's just get on with it. So what do they get in this building? 70,000 feet, square feet of construction and research space. Don't ask me to go metric, I couldn't tell you. Um, and in 1919, you can see these two handsome masts of four, 450 feet were erected, <sighs> which they could string up various experimental antennas, etc. Um, so all of a sudden, you know, by, well, in 19 or 20 years, you've gone from 
virtually nothing to a, quite a successful company. Now we're just moving on a little bit, the Great War, World War One, and uh, a little bit of work on communication in flight, because obviously we had the, the, the British had the Royal Flying Corps, the forerunner of the RAF, and a lot of it was spotting work to go out and see what the enemy positions were and what they were up to, you know, maybe and send some messages back. Now imagine flying a, a, um, a, one of the early aircraft with its wooden framework and canvas, and it's, it, it's not an easy thing to keep level in the sky. And then to add to that, you've got to try and operate some, um, oh, just letting someone else into the room, bear with me. Yes, yeah, so you've not only have you got to fly this crate of an aircraft, watch out for enemy aircraft, and who might be trying to take pot shots at you. But you've also got spark gap transmitter, a, a very small spark transmitter to, to, to carry with you. And effectively, you had the, um, at the pilot of the aircraft's feet, you had a, a battery, some sort of um, cell, you know, the old glass cells. And the transmitter was literally sat in his lap. Transmitter stroke receiver was sat on his lap. So he's got to try and handle the controls of the aircraft and handle having this on his lap, along with a key that's the strap to his tie or whatever else. Um, it couldn't have been very easy. I just want to mention here that it was a, a chap called Captain Henry Joseph Round. We're just calling Captain Round. Uh, from 1881 to 1966, he lived. But he was Marconi's personal assistant from 1902, so prior to World War I. Well, I've just joined this meeting, so. Hi, John. Um, I, I'm sorry, mate. Yeah. I thought I was muted. Don't worry. Um, so, Captain Round had joined uh, the RFC and uh, was helping out with some of the design work for some of their early um, communications for aircraft. So, Round was partly responsible for de developing the, the um, vacuum tubes, or as we call them, valves over here, um, for the Marconi company. And you've got the um, Q valve, which I think is the top of those two. And the companion V24, someone might tell me which ones is which. But it's these two valves that help lead to reliable communication in flight, voice communication. So you can see that Marconi have gone from having no voice communications work at all prior to World War I. But we're coming out of the war with some fledgling development in this area. I know that other, other countries in the world are doing similar, but we're looking particularly that's, um, I'm just adding someone else, sorry, to the room. J-Z-H, um, Tommy. Apologies, folks. So by the end of the war, Marconi have got some fledgling um, voice communications equipment. And I'm sure that voice must have been a lot easier to operate with flying an aircraft. Certainly one of these um, World War I crates. We've all seen film of them. I've never been up in one, let alone do a wing walk or anything other stupid thing that they do on some of them, but uh, there. Let's see if we can get onto the next slide. Right. So I'm not going to go talking about how a valve works. You guys mostly know the basic principle of a valve. But these valves or tubes, as um, Jeff would rather call them, I'm sure, um, change everything. However, before we go to valves again, radio returns to peacetime activity, which means that amateurs are back on the bands. And there's the commercial traffic back on the bands. And if anyone's listening at home, they're going to be using some sort of crystal set. Um, whether it's completely homemade or whether you bought a nice um, early set from somewhere. And the amateurs, a lot of them were ex-servicemen with experience of wireless. So there was suddenly this boom of interest. Um, there's probably these cat's whiskers and, and other such receivers coming in. So there's very little to listen to. Anyway, we haven't got broadcasts in the UK. You do have some early broadcasts in, in mainland Europe coming in by the early 1920s as well. 
but uh, we're just concentrating on the UK here. So, you know, military, um, maybe some commercial traffic, and in the early 20s, the experimental broadcast from Paris, the Netherlands, and um, if propagation would allow, which I doubt, the USA also, you know, with the, with the primitive equipment. Most use a cat's whisker, with of course with this Galena crystal, or if you couldn't get hold of a Galena crystal, you'd make your own crystal by melting down. I don't know if anyone's tried this, that you used to get the lead salt toy soldiers made out of lead, lead and uh, you'd uh, melt them down and um, mix a few flowers of sulfur to create lead sulfite. And that's an artificial crystal and I've tried it, it does work. So <clears throat> if you were going to listen to this, you know, you'd have a, a set of high impedance headphones. But uh, does anyone like to tell me if you've got the headphones, but you, there's more than one of you wants to listen, I and mean, this is what grandfather used to do this, how would, how would you make it so that more of you might be able to hear? What could you do? Anyone like to hazard a guess? Anybody at all? John must know. I'll put you out of misery. What my grandfather used to do, they used a big um, ceramic um, mixing bowl that is, is my great great grandmother would have made uh, puddings and things in and he'd put the headphones in there and it would act like a bit of a chamber just like a horn just to amplify the sound <clears throat> and then the family would sit around with their ear pressed towards this pudding bowl to hear what was going on <laughs> um, not, we, let's face it not not um not great and uh, <laughs> you still think a lot of the lot of the transmissions you're listening to at this time are, are not particularly uh, very, on a very accurate frequency especially if they're spark you know there's quite a broad frequency range so it must have been quite challenging listening to amateurs and, and trying to tune and, and discriminate from one signal to another. But we had the crystal sets, they, they started to get a little bit better. And uh, the ceramic bowls were, were stolen from a lot of mothers in their, uh, in their rooms. Right, in 1920, we're going back now to the um, New Street Works and some of their experimental work. We mentioned uh, Captain, uh, what was his name? Captain uh, Round. There's Captain Round, sat at the um, transmitter Marconi Zulu X-ray MZX, which was their um, experimental transmitter, uh, which the, um, the, the GPO, the General Post Office, so the British Post Office issued a license in accordance with the uh, Wireless Telegraphy Act of 1904 for, um, the purpose of conducting experimental transmissions, voice transmissions mainly, from the New Street Works with this, this transmitter. And um, so you've got Captain Round and a chap called Mr. Ditcham who were doing some of the uh, work here on, on producing this transmitter. Um, this wasn't organized and advertised regular transmissions. These were just ad hoc when they had time, you know, they made some improvements to the transmitter, let's try it out, et cetera, et cetera. So they were regular, they weren't publicized, but they were sending something like this, very exciting. MZX calling, MZX calling. This is the Marconi valve transmitter in Chelmsford, England. Testing on a wavelength of 2,750 meters. How are our signals coming in today? Can you hear us clearly? And here comes the exciting bit. I shall now recite a list of times and stations from the Bradshaw's Railway timetable, which was a <laughs> Victorian style book. And then you'd have 20 minutes, a half an hour of ditch or round, whoever's on the microphone, quite often Captain Round, um, reading all the stations, say from Birmingham to Birmingham New Street to London Euston, including all the times and stopping, or they pick some obscure branch line. So almost as tedious as listening to me this evening. You know, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, <laughs> it, it wasn't really what people wanted to hear. But they did get some listener reports coming in. You know, a lot of these amateurs and people at home did write into the Marconi company, you know, a few dozen here and there, saying, we're receiving you, but it's not very exciting to listen to. Um, just interesting to say that the maximum output of the MZX transmitter was 15 kilowatts. So it was a reasonably, um, reasonably strong. As I said, 214 reception reports. There you go. Um, sent to Marconi for amateurs and ship's captains. It did cover quite a good distance away. Now, 
Those are the very early ones. By the 15th of November, of January, Ditchham decided to try something different. He'd read the news. He's the first news reader, <laughs> news broadcaster in the UK. And he had a, he had a copy of the, the, the Daily Times in front of him and just chose a few stories and headlines to read out. And then he played a, a few gramophone records, rather like Fessenden was um, claimed to do. He, read, he played some gramophone records on the wind-up gramophone. Um, but just think of that, 2,800 metres was the frequency, you know, 2,800 metre band. Um, even with those huge antenna masts, that's going to be a very, very inefficient system. Um, now, I want to pick on someone different this time. Let's see who I've got down here. John, Mr. Petters, can you hear me? He needs to take his mute off. Could, John, yes. do you know the, who, was, who was the first woman, lady, uh, to broadcast on the wireless in Britain? Um, I'm feeling it might be Dame Nellie Melba, but I'm not absolutely sure. Well, we'll wait and find out then. Thank you. <laughs> it's quite a well-known broadcast, that, which we will cover. However, you're incorrect, John. This is Miss Winifred Sayer. And I'm just trying to find my correct page. Who worked for a local audio recording company in New Street in Chelmsford, working with gramophone, rec producing gramophone records and what have you. She was invited up to the, new, uh, to the, um, to the works to do um, three 15 minute performances on MZX. Um, don't know a huge amount about, about her, but you know, MZX was um, broadcasting twice a day for 30 minutes at 11 and 8. They weren't advertised, it wasn't a scheduled broadcast, but a bit of news and a bit of entertainment. And Miss Winifred Sayer, who, who was a bit of a soprano type, not a professional, but obviously a good amateur, that was the first female voice on the radio in the, in the United Kingdom. And uh, that's the one that's quite often forgotten in due, it was John mentioned a certain young lady. Well, not so young when she did it. Um, but this is where we start to get towards this. This is where our newspaper magnate comes in. Alfred Harmsworth, the first Viscount Norcliffe, founder of the Daily Mail newspaper. Now, he was quite clever as a newspaper man. Oh, hang on, a cup of tea coming, I think. This is good. Thank you very much. A cup of tea coming my way. Um, he was quite clever as a newspaper man. His idea was that to all his, his editor and all the writers that we keep the stories short. They must be no longer than 250 words. Not like the Times that have gone interminable amount of space, but 250 words um, or under or less and every day should include at least one salacious murder story. <laughs> uh, sense of it, it worked. Um, the paper <laughs> at this point was, if not the best, but possibly the first or second best selling newspaper in the United Kingdom. And he'd become very, very wealthy because of it. Now, recognising that these um, transmissions, these ad hoc transmissions of Ditcham and Round were getting quite interesting with the news and a bit of music, and with our friend uh, Winifred Sayer there. Um, he suddenly thought there was a bit of a publicity gimmick he could do here. And um, that might help him sell some newspapers as well. So he commissioned the world's first advertised public broadcast, or possibly if not the world's first, the UK's first, we'll, we'll, we'll put it at that. And it was to include an internationally, internationally renowned superstar, singing superstar. Now, Harmsworth persuaded um, an Australian prima donna by the name of Dame Nellie Melba, there we go, John, we get to Nellie Melba now, to perform at Marconi's new factory. She wasn't really persuaded by this. Um, you know, what's wireless? She'd never heard of radio wireless. What is it? You know, you want to sing to nobody effectively into a microphone. Made no sense to her. But the offer of £1,000 and lots of publicity seemed to do the trick. Uh, she, was at, she was 60, the, the argument was she was coming to the end of her career, her voice wasn't what it was, etc. 
So I suspect the offer of the publicity was the thing that really did it and the little bit of, you know, little bit of money that uh, came along. Well, this is fine, but Ditcham and Round at, at, uh, at the Marconi factory were given about two, two, two and a half weeks to prepare for this. Um, they had no formal studio to use. So they had to search for a suitable place for Nelly to perform. At first, there was this rather plush office with nice wood panelling and carpet was chosen. However, to get from, the, from this office in one end of the building to the transmitter room, they had to have an awful lot of cables running throughout the building to carry signals back. And it was quite high voltage on it because of the design. And um, they managed to have a fire, not a huge fire, but they, the, the, the cables went up in flames, scorching the carpet as, as the wires burnt up like a fuse. Um, so they were told quite quickly by the Marconi senior team there that they had to do something different. You need a new room closer to the transmitter. So they found a nice storeroom, a store cupboard, a broom cupboard sort of thing. It's a bit bigger than a broom cupboard, but this smaller room to use as a studio. So the walls, which were just brick coloured, were hastily whitewashed. All the furniture and rubbish removed and a nice piece of carpet was laid on the floor. The piano was added and the microphone. This is where we come. This microphone, remember that early slide I showed you at the beginning? It had um, a telephone, hat stand, elastic and a cigar box. Well, have a look at the microphone she's using. The actual microphone element is from a, those candlestick telephones. It's um, being suspended using elastic, knicker elastic, from a hat, uh, the remnants of a hat stand to try and reduce vibration, etc. And to connect all that nice, her lovely singing voice in, um, they created a horn, a wooden horn made out of a, a cigar box. All things they had their hands, because don't forget, a broadcast uh, microphone didn't exist. So it was a case of what can we produce? And um, it might look ugly, but it did seem to do the trick. Now, Dame Nelly arrived on the day, this great day for the uh, broadcast. And Dame Nelly, as it said, was shown nervously around the factory by this um, one of these junior uh, Marconi employees. And he's pointing out where the, the huge 140 foot masts were. And uh, this is, you know, telling this is where the transmission goes from. This is where your sound goes from. And uh, Dame Nelly was most put out, imagining she got to climb to the top. She's heard to say, young man, if you think I'm going to climb all the way up there and sing for you or anyone else, then he was very much mistaken. Then they showed her the studio. Uh, she wasn't particularly happy with that. <laughs> the carpet on the floor, which had been laid specially for her, she decided that would ruin the acoustics and the sound of her voice. So it had to be hastily removed. However, just before 7 p.m., the transmitter, the valves were glowing and they were sending a CW signal out to, to identify the station. And this was a, used to allow, of course, there wasn't accurate frequency counters and everything else and, you know, crystal sets. It, you had some time with CW, which meant that people could tune in and find the signal for MZX. So people would be what they called listening in, ready for the great lady. So what date do we go now? Did I actually make a note of the date of this? Yeah, 15th of June, there we go. So at 7 p.m., 7.10 rather, there was just the, the CW stopped and through the, the ether and the crackle, there was this voice, a male voice, just simply introduced Dame Nelly Melba, who will now sing. And then her usual trill voice, trill voice, really shocking voice, um, she started to sing, the song, There's No Place Like Home. And when I say a voice, I find it shocking. You go on YouTube later and uh, Dame Nelly Melbourne, have a listen. <laughs> I know it's older recording techniques, but um, she wouldn't be top of the hit parade these days, put it that way. Um, it was all going quite well. 
she got into a stride singing into to nobody in a room holding a microphone seemed to be enjoying it and um the marconi employees and and um lord harmsworth are all quite happy that this is going very well and lord harmsworth thinking about how many newspapers he's going to sell off the back of this reporting this great um success and then what happened now out in the transmitter room the uh the, the, the ditch um, and uh, Captain Round were looking after the transmitter and they got it started to worry because they were listening back to the audio from this transmission. It started to sound in quotes strange there was something going on. And then with an almighty bang, one of the output valves failed and they were off air, no longer transmitting. So what on earth were they to do? So quick thinking, the engineers came up with a plan and they never to ever told Dame Nelly the truth about this. A young employee who was a brother was sent to say to Dame Nelly in the, in, the, in the studio, Dame Nelly, he said, the public is listening and they want more, lots more. This seemed to please her, the Dame, you know, they liked to have their ego stroked a little bit. <laughs> so she carried on singing, unbeknownst that she wasn't on air. She was only supposed to do a couple of songs, you see. So while this, was whilst this went on, the engineers hastily in installed a spare valve and they, was, they had stored elsewhere in the factory. So there's a lot of running around in this huge factory. And once again, the receivers of people around the nation and further afield were filled with the sound of a piano and Dame Nelly singing. And she sang two more songs and finished off with the national anthem, God Save the King. And then simply the announcer just finished by saying, saying this, you have been listening to Dame Nelly Melba sing, good night, and that was it. So despite the problems received, this broadcast was a hit and reports were received, or you know, reception reports were received from all over the UK. Uh, various transatlantic ships en route who were from Canada and the US. Uh, it was even picked up in Iran. So, you know, I'm not sure the equipment they were using, but it was, there was a confirmed report in Iran. And in Paris, it's alleged that the reception was so powerful from the a receiving station at the Eiffel Tower, that they actually um, recorded some of the um, transmission onto a disc. Now, I'm, I'm inclined to believe that, but no one knows where these discs have gone. And wouldn't that be a find if someone suddenly discovered in their attic space or in a cellar that these discs, no matter how poor the audio quality of this first official broadcast on the UK. So Lord Harmsworth made an absolute killing off this in terms of newspaper sales, publicity. Marconi did very well, started to sell more receiving you know, equipment to, for the people at home wanted to pay for a quick license and get on and have a listen to what was going on. And then there was more um, broadcasts from MZX that were arranged um, on an irregular basis, but they would pop up in the newspaper, yeah. sometimes just gramophone records. And then we had the, in this one, we've got the famous Italian tenor, Loritz Melchior, I can't pronounce his name, who performed in July 1920 from the same room as Dame Nelly had. And you can see from that wider picture of this storeroom come studio, just how bare and austere it was. This isn't the modern day studio with soundproofing on the walls. This was, I'd imagine, quite an echo in there. So MZX got quite a following, you know, of a few thousand listening. However, there's always a politician to spoil the fun with these things. And in this case, Albert Holden Illingworth, who was then known as the Postmaster General. So responsible for the post office, uh, all the telephone communications and this fledgling wireless and all the, you know, all the commercial wireless goes on. At this point in time, the Postmaster General was a, a position on the cabinet. It was a, quite a senior position in the, in the government. Um, he received quite a lot of um, letters from the military and other commercial, you know, commercial concerns, some of the early airfields that were having um, wireless communications on planes coming in and out of the UK. That MZX could possibly, and I do mean possibly, interfere with commercial traffic. And uh, bowing to business concerns, this little experimental station, well, little, this single experimental station was taken off air. Much to the, you know, a lot of people were not happy about this because they, even though they were only 
occasional broadcasts and, and just here and there, they were really popular. However, we can all nowadays complain about radio amateurs with the foundation or the intermediate or the full license using more power than they're allowed to. Amateurs have always been known to be a little bit rebellious. And a lot of amateurs who were, you know, perhaps come back from the war and, and started to tinker with initially CW, but then into this voice communication, uh, continued to broadcast music and such like illegally. So the amateurs were broadcasting as opposed to the point to point communication they were supposed to do. But that proved quite popular, believe it or not. So, you know, pirate radio, I suppose you'd call it now, wouldn't you? But this is where we move from the New Street Works in Chelmsford to a small village called Rittle in Essex, just outside, it's just a few miles outside of Chelmsford. And um, this is where I think, this is my favorite bit of the story. We're getting towards the last few minutes of it, but this is where we go. This hut was described by the Marconi Company. It was one of their buildings. It's an ex-World War I military hut that had been used for some sort of training facility. It was described as a long, low hut in a muddy field. And this long, low hut in a muddy field was the Marconi Department for the design of aircraft and field equipment, mainly looking at voice communications. Um, it wasn't the easiest of places to work. It's about having an old fashioned scout hut, you know, if anyone was doing the Boy Scouts and had a little wooden hut, this is very much that affair. Um, there was no power, no electricity, they had a generator for that. There was no mains water, they had to get it in in flasks and, and urns and churns to keep them going. They had a small solid, you know, cast iron stove burning coke and bits of coal, whatever they could get hold of to keep warm. Um, Stuart, we'll go with Stuart. What do you think the toilet was? What do you think they used for a toilet? You'd have to put his mic on, Stuart. Go on, Matt, Stuart. Um, I don't know. What, a hole in the ground? <laughs> Almost. I don't know what they did for the, the other stuff, but mainly, just for a quick um, water stop, as it were, they had the horn of a vintage, gra an old gramophone, those huge horns. And I just shoved it into a hedgerow. So it just took the, the liquid away from your feet. And that was it. Um, so it wasn't the most salubrious of places, but must they did an awful lot of good work here. Must have all worn suede shoes, I reckon. Yeah, exactly, yes. Now this work was um, carried out by this chap in the top picture there, Captain Peter Pendleton Eckersley, no, normally known by his colleagues as PPE not personal protective equipment, but Peter Pendleton Eckersley, uh, born in Mexico, died in Hammersmith in 63. And he was, he was the head of this, this very small section. And so eight, nine of them, the, the, the uh, aircraft and field uh, communication section at Rittle. And that's all there. It's not the clearest of pictures, but there's um, eight gentlemen and one lady. So I'm, quite, I'm not quite sure in the early days where she went to the toilet because trying to use a, um, a gramophone horn into a hedge wouldn't have been particularly easy for her, I'd imagine, but um, we'll gloss over that one. Now, um, Pendleton was also a member of the Royal Flying Corps in, um, World, in the First World War, so he, he got his first taste of wireless and then voice communications there. And uh, came out from the war and ended up working with Marconi. Now, all of this team were real pioneers in, in early radio broadcasting and design. And every single one of that team photo down below all ended up working for the BBC in various capacities uh, a couple of, within the next couple of years. Well, you know, down in this little hut, they were kept busy working on various projects for Marconi. There was always something going on. However, in their spare time, they built a transmitter to a, a fairly standard Marconi design. We'll see the circuit diagram in a minute. And this was at a time, what year are we looking at again? We'll come to it in a minute. But this is early 1922 you're heading towards now. This is at a time when attitudes to broadcast were changing again. There'd been some more pressure on the, the government. And out of this pressure, um, this little transmitter was issued the call sign to Mike Tango, 2MT, which was, um, in the phonetics of the day was two Emma Tock. 
to Emma Tock. So they built this transmitter. They're getting involved with the village life. They used to go to, I think it was called The Bell. The Bell was the pub. They used to be up there for meals and drinking rather quite late at night. Um, they used to play football and cricket against the locals and generally just were known around the village. So this is not the circuit diagram. I think we've got that in a moment, but this is the uh, a slightly poor picture, but a picture of the, uh, the transmitter they were using to Emma Tock. Now they were allowed to broadcast. This wasn't just ad hoc. This was allowed to broadcast 30 minutes a week at a specific time. So this was a scheduled broadcast that suddenly people got to know about. And what it had to do from 1900, so 7 p.m. until 7.25, they transmitted a CW signal, it's a carrier wave, just to identify the station, just sending out the, you know, this is 2MT, et cetera. For, so the listeners in could find um, where they were. And then from 1925 to 1955, there's a 30 minute window when there's voice transmission. They could pretty much transmit what they wanted, but it was voice transmission in that 30 minute window. However, after every eight, eight minutes, they had to stop and listen on a listening set and a receiver. And um, so that if, there's any, if they were interfering with any commercial traffic, someone would notify them. And if that was the case, they were to close down. So ever generous, the, the post office, the GPO, 30 minutes of transmission time in voice, but it wasn't really 30 minutes because it's 24 when you take these two minute slots out. But 2MT was on the air. And from the uh, 14th of February, 1922, so 100 years ago last month, 2MT made its first transmission. And we could guess who, who was the presenter. It was PPE, P.P. Eckersley, who made a few comments, read a little bit of news and played a few gramophone records. Nothing too exciting. Now, telegrams were, were received from many listeners all around the UK and slightly um, positive, uh, slightly further afield as well, rather. But Eckersley was always a bit of a rebel. Bearing in mind the GPO had said eight minutes of broadcast, two minutes of receiving to see if you're interfering and throughout the, the 30 minutes. He completely ignored them and just transmitted for 30 minutes. And uh, thoroughly enjoyed himself, he's a bit of a show off. So a very rough um, transmitter design, I'm not gonna go through it, you can see it there. But the wavelength is 700 meters, so we're coming down slightly more from where we were, where the other one was up at 2,800 meters. Uh, with an approximate power level of, to the antenna system of uh, 200 watts. And uh, the antenna system was a four wire inverted L configuration. So like four wires running out and they sort of fanned out across a field, but in inverted L's um, on 110 foot portable wooden masts. Um, so again, 140 foot long elements, these four elements, but um, again, another very inefficient antenna system. You know, us amateurs always know about inefficient antenna systems when we try and operate top band from a, a garden that's about 12 yards long, like I do on occasion. But um, where there's a will, there's a way, shall we say. So these, these uh, transmissions from 2MT carried on for almost 12 months. They carried on into January 17th, 1923. Eckersley, PPE, he became the main man. He, he was responsible. He was the only voice you heard on every single broadcast. The rest of his team helped, you know, with background noises, playing pianos, whatever else that was going on, looking after the transmitter. But he was the presenter. He wrote most of the script, if there ever was a script. And he had a wicked sense of humour. Um, we, we mentioned the pub in the village a few hundred yards away, the bell. They used to borrow the piano for every week and take it. They were seen on a Tuesday evening, early, early on a Tuesday evening, with a wheelbarrow, walking out the village with a wheelbarrow, with a gardening wheelbarrow, with a piano in it, tied down. And they'd take it back afterwards, after the, trans, the broadcast, and then go and get very drunk in the pub. Um, 
So that must be quite a sight, moving this piano every week. Uh, because they also found it really good fun to, to get the gramophone record and to punch a new hole in it off centre. So when you played it, you speeded it up and slowed it down on the wind at gramophone. It made all sorts of horrendous noises. It's a bit like if anyone knows the Goon Show in the UK, they did silly things like that in some of their uh, sort of things. They um, did some Shakespeare, where Eckersley was every character in the play. Um, they, he also one week said that next week we're going to have a, an evening of great music and arias and opera. And he performed all of them by all accounts very badly. So he's a bit of a show off, wasn't he? Um, the post office noticed that this was going on and because they, they issued the license, but they were issuing licenses for listeners because you had to have a listening license. And they were selling more and more of those. And then, of course, the manufacturers, Marconi and all the other wireless manufacturers were noticing that sales of headphones, um, complete receivers and spare parts to make your own receiver, they were being sold like never before. This is pretty much where we get towards the end, because what leads on from to Emma Tock in Riddle was the, found, the funding of the, B, the, the founding of the BBC, the, then the British Broadcasting Company, as it was then. It wasn't the end for Eckersley. He um, got a job at the new fledgling BBC as its chief, its first chief engineer. And on the right there, it's a slightly poor picture, but that's 2LO, to Lee Marosco in Modern Phonetics, the first BBC uh, transmitter, which was in the Marconi building in London. And I'm sure someone will tell me which building, so I can't remember. And that first broadcast on November 22, just a couple of months before 2MOT went off the air forever. So we're almost there, but I'm just going to finish with this, that all of that team that had helped Ditcham and Round ended up working at the BBC for a while, all the two Emma T lot crew from, from the Riddle hut worked at the BBC. We've said Marconi, Eckersley, sorry, was the first chief engineer and did some great work. Then they employed someone called uh, John Reith as the first director, de director general. And anyone who knows anything about John Reed, he was quite a, he's had quite a, a strict Christian, probably more Methodist or Puritanical sort of upbringing. And he sacked Eckersley after a couple of years. Does anyone know why he sacked Eckersley? Divorce. Divorce. Thank you. Well done, Ian. Eckersley had the temerity to get divorced, which wasn't done in those days. And certainly not often. And Reith was not impressed, and he was dismissed immediately. So the end of Eckersley, who never ever after two Emma talk did he ever broadcast again. He was never on the microphone again. He was the engineer. So that stunted his show off side. But <laughs> by the end of 22 and into early 1923, we've got the BBC started. And as we say, there's a whole other talk about the BBC, which we will leave to someone who has got better knowledge than I. All I would say is thank you for listening, and um, I hope that wasn't too tedious. Yeah, well researched. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I think well researched. It, it, it's the result of various readings. Uh, Merv's got one of the books um, that we've used. Um, hi, Tommy. There's SA2CLC that's joined us at some point, and. Uh, Various people have joined us at some point or another, so it's it's nice. And John Mr. Humphreys, but no, it, I, it's just a bit of history, isn't it? If you if you if you like your amateur radio and, and some of the historic side, sometimes it's nice to dip into a bit of history. Um, and there's so you know, I'm reading now about what the BBC did in World War Two, and some you know some of the things that they developed over that period from from new, from journalism and broadcasting from the front lines to, you know, some of their recording equipment and the changes they made in that. There's always something fascinating to read somewhere. Have you got the Ace of Briggs um, volumes about the history of broadcasting in the United Kingdom? Say again? The Ace of Briggs uh, volumes of broadcasting in the United Kingdom. There, yeah. I think there's four or five of them. I've got three, got them from work. Very good. Um, I've never read them because, well, you don't read, it's, yeah, it's heavy going, but... Um, I think it's the definitive, they were the definitive yeah. works in, uh, particularly about covering the BBC in the war years and all that kind of thing. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I need to do some more reading there because I'm just it's just interesting to have a look at. Just bear with me one second. I'll find the book. <laughs> um. I'm going to say good night. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Simon. No problem. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Oh, where's my camera gone? I've knocked my camera off. That wasn't planned either. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Simon. I'm going to have to queue up. Yeah, sorry, now. guys. I, mean, I tried to keep it short. Really interesting. Thanks a lot. See yeah. you next time. There's a book here called 2MT Rittle, uh, The Birth of Broadcast, British Broadcasting, which is by a, a historian called Tim Wander, W-A-N-D-E-R, Wander. And he does separate books on the Hall Street works, oh, the New Street I was just work. going to show it, Simon. <laughs> That's a different one, though. That's the Centenary book, which is a different one. What's that one called? From Marconi to Melba. Yeah, which um, is that's more slightly more of a copy table book. There's some brilliant illustrations and photographs mm -hmm. in that one. But um, anyone who likes a nice, you know, little bit of... It's not heavyweight bedtime reading, but the, the, these have got some great information in. Um, it's just a fascinating history because I just find it, whether we look at the British side or whether we looked at um, in Belgium with Roland, who's there, or wherever you look, there's, there's all these pioneers in this sort of field, isn't there? Um, we all know with a lot of this, Marconi seems to get all the glory. And he certainly did, certainly with the UK, with, you know, broadcasting starting off. But as we said, we had Fessenden in the US. It's just a shame that no one actually record, not recorded, made a recording, but actually made a note that he made this broadcast on Christmas Eve. Because I say it was 20 odd years, it's about almost 20 years later when it actually came out that he'd done this. Whereas you'd think that actually there are people with receivers, otherwise you wouldn't be transmitting. That There was commercial receivers and crystal sets and things going on. You think someone would have said, well, hang on, who's this fella playing a violin? <laughs> what is this I can hear? You know, and it would have been reported in, a, in the press somewhere. Um, but I just find it fascinating. So thank you for listening. I'm sorry I, if I've sent you to sleep, then, you know, I'm better than a cup of Bovril or a, or an oval team. <laughs> Who did you actually produce the uh, talk for? I mean, you obviously not just for us. So have you, what, what other people have you given it to? Well, no, it started as just something to do with my local radio club, Dragon Amateur Radio Club. Okay. And then it's gone through the Gwyneth Engineering Society, um, a, a WI, <laughs> Women's Institute, and you just change it and tweak it slightly, but it's not a technical talk, it's just a nice yeah. general romp through a bit of history. Key does. Say again, Robert? Yeah, to say the same, Robert. Key, key, key does, because that's all I heard it last time. Telford, yeah, I know it's been, you know, I just, I'm, while I was working on something new, I thought, well, I could, yeah, there's John, look, I thought I'd give it again because, you know, we need to fill some time in, we've got uh, the talk on KW Electronics coming up, which will be a brand new talk from uh, Steve Shorey, G3ZPS, who's written it, you know, he's been on and done a talk before, hasn't he, to us um, about old ham radio gear, why the hell do we bother? Um, but he's a great fan of the, the KW equipment, having lived just down the road from the, the manufacturing base in Dartford in Kent. Um, and just, uh, Jeff, you wouldn't know KW Electronics, but it was probably in its day the biggest um, amateur radio equipment manufacturer in the UK, if not the biggest we've ever had, possibly, um, for just purely amateur radio equipment. No longer with us, like many things, comes and goes. Um, but uh, I, I twisted his arm just before Christmas saying, do you know what, Steve, it'd be nice if you came and gave us a talk on KW, the history of the KW company and its founder. And he said, Oh, I've been talking about doing that for years, but I'm too Simon, busy at the minute. Yeah. How easy would it be for you to put the slides back up uh, and show me Admiralty Building again? Oh, yeah. Is it the wrong building? No, no. <laughs> Bear with just, me then. It's easy I just enough. Want to exchange something with you. Yeah, see if I can find it again now. Better, what was it, third or fourth or something? Yeah, it's easy enough. Don't worry. Once we let this thing catch up uh, a bit further. Oh, what's it done now? Let's just go back. This would be easier, wouldn't it? Sorry, oh, chaps. There we go. There you go. Hey, I, I, can't, I can't move the mouse to show you, but you see the central archway? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I used to pull up there in a yeah. military land in a military Land Rover. Right. Every Thursday morning at eleven a.m., <laughs> I'd come over from Chelsea Barracks, and I used to go up to the first floor. You see, see the first floor. Yeah. Uh, left, left a bit, left a bit, left a bit. Keep going left. Keep going left. Keep, keep going left, and stop. In that room there was mm -hmm. the signals was the signals dispatch section for headquarters, London District. Uh, we used to uh, used to grab the mail from there. And um, I believe on the second floor, the, right. uh, the Royal Navy had a lot of um, uh, rakel equipment and D11 transmitters, which are, and D13 transmitters, which again were used, um, uh, were, were, were made by Marconi. But most importantly, though, Simon, yeah, down the bottom below the archway, see this sort of fawn coloured long thing by the cannon, left to right. What do you call this place here? Where is it? Go on. It's hallowed ground, that is, you know. Is it? That's, that's Horse Guards Parade. Yes, it is, isn't it? And I've, I've been on there several times in my past. Well, you talked about, um, you talked also about, um, oh dear, what was it now? Uh, spiders. Uh, yeah. Uh, Nissan huts. Well, when yeah. I joined as a boy soldier in September 1969, at the guards depot in Purbright, we were living in spiders and Nissan huts <laughs> for the first 18 months of our service. And we had down the one end of the room, a um, typical Starlag 51 uh, stove with a pipe going up out the roof. We had a coal book. We had a coal bucket to the left of it. And of course you had to walk about a hundred yards to go and fill the coal bucket up. Yeah. Uh, we used to take it in turns, but the windows were a single pane glass and in the winter you know you could wipe the condensation off but so you you always made a, when you were moving into a new nissan hut you always made a beeline for the, the closest one to the fire <laughs> I'm, not so, I'm, not, I'm not surprised i was um because i think it's been a day off today and yeah. uh beth her wife and i had a little drive it's only 70 miles to better sequoia and yeah. we go through capo Keurig. Couple of Keurig, the um, as the the army base there when they come up and do sort of various training in the mountains, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and those are used, they're not quite the up. same huts, but they're still single story wooden huts, many of them, and they're single panes of glass in those, and, and we most of it was in darkness today, but we did notice lighting in one hut, and it looked across, yeah. and they were all misty because it was damp outside, and so there was still <clears> condensation <throat> in them, <laughs> so rather than than me. Very good talk, by the way. Well, uh, yes, you know, it's very good. If, yeah, uh, great. <laughs> if, if I was slightly off topic in a couple of places, because I haven't given the talk for about eight months, and uh, I was trying not to use notes, which sometimes is a silly thing to do, because it just just have a few just to remind yourself the the main points. You're okay, Jeff. Yeah, it might might be worth you offering it to you three A's, Simon. Yeah, yeah. Because they've got all sorts of different interest groups, and uh, uh, and that's the thing. The the other point is uh, I. Probably you've all read it, but yeah. if anyone hasn't, The World at Their Fingertips by G6CL is very interesting and yeah. covers a lot of this period that you were you were doing in, in, in the talk, Simon, which I thought was very interesting and taught me a lot. Yeah, thank you. It's, um, it's always nice to ask people who was the first woman to sing on the radio, you know, to, to perform or to appear on radio and then, and then tell them they're wrong. <laughs> Because Nelly Melbourne is the obvious, the obvious answer, isn't it? You're right, John. So, uh, yeah. Simon, I, I have a, a recommendation uh, for as, as somebody who, if, those who are interested in Marconi, this yeah. is, a, is a wonderful book and it combines murder and Marconi. And it's by a terrific writer, Eric Larson, and it's called Thunderstruck. It was a New York Times bestseller, I don't know what, 10 years ago. But it covers a lot of Marconi's earlier days onto his affiliation with White Star. <coughs> and it com combines it with a famous, uh, true, I think, uh, British murder story. So it, it, it reads, you just, you'll just zip right through it. So Thunderstruck by Eric Larson. I, I actually have a look for that now. Um, I say I Recommend it highly. Yeah. I've always come to the end of this volume of reading about the, the BBC and the war. 
I've also got one about um, Germany's um, propaganda, wireless propaganda from, you know, the early 1930s through to 45, which I want to look at as well, because that could combine then into quite an interesting talk between the two. Um, Germany uh, calling. Yes. Germany calling. Yes, Mr. <laughs> Joyce, thank you. There's the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I've got to go, folks. So no, uh, nice thank you very you. much. Cheers, everyone. Cheers, John. Cheers. Bye-bye. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise as well, Simon. That was why the hand was up. But uh, always a pleasure. Never a chore. And I'll catch you at the weekend. Yeah, I'll speak to you Sunday, okay. John. Yeah, see you soon. Okay, Bye-bye. So I've got to go as well, Simon. Uh, 73s. Nice okay. talk again. Thanks for coming, Merv. Catch you again. Yeah, and anyone else. But uh, they all slowly disappear at this time of night. Because it was it quarter past nine local. What's it? What time is it with you, uh, Jeff? Uh, it's about four. It's four fifteen actually. So it's still oh. light and eighty degrees and lovely. What's eighty degrees in modern money? I see. It's funny. I, I wear in feet and inches, but temperature using them. Oh, geez, don't ask me. I, 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 I'm still. I live in nineteen sixty, so don't uh, ask it's me. About, <laughs> it's about twenty five, twenty eight cent Celsius. And what we had today is seven degrees Celsius over here today. Yeah. The maximum. Oh, boy. And then um, dri driving through the national park, through the mountains of Snowdonia to, to, to Betasakoid, we had every single season, we had sunshine. We had a little bit of rain, a bit of sleet, and then very heavy hailstones coming down. And I'm beginning to think, why on earth are we going out in this? And then we got to, uh, to Betasakoid, just pulling into the car park, and the sun came out, and it was beautiful. So we had a bit of a walk by the river and coffee and cake, and then we came home. I was quite happy. So my first, my first experience of better sequoid, yeah, at the age of what, I suppose, fifteen and three quarters, we woke up on the morning, out of our bivouacs at six fifteen a.m., when this Scots Guards land sergeant shouted at us to get out of bed. I can imagine. And uh, swimming trunks on, right across the river now. Oh my life! What, what did I panic? But I, I made it, and we had to come back again. Yeah, well, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, I must admit, I sometimes feel quite lucky to live up here. It's um, you know, we're all lucky to live somewhere, aren't we? But uh, it's it's a nice part of the world, actually. Yeah. Um, and no, uh, and I don't work at Tesco supermarket anymore, so it's even better. <laughs> Working in a cathedral is lovely. It's just peaceful. Uh -huh. usually and there's always some old deer that comes along to help and volunteer that makes tea and cake so it, I'm, I'm well fed I'm well watered and I'm on holy ground I mean what more could I wish for <laughs> Simon how far back does excuse me how far back does that cathedral go how when was it built now the actual building is oh gosh now it'll come to me it's actually the actual site of the cathedral the cell, the, the monastic cell that started it, mm -hmm. yep. is the oldest cathedral in England and Wales. Wow. 540 mm. odd. I forget the exact, 542 or thereabouts, he laid the fence to enclose their um, monastic grounds. And it was a, a picket fence with, 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 bits wo you know, with bits woven between it. And mm -hmm. it's called Bangor. Bangor is, the, with the, you have to roll the R at the end, and I can't be in English. Bangor is, is actually the word for fence or, in, or in enclosure. And that's where... I've been the to Bangor like, twice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's where the city gets its name from. Ah. There, there are a few remnants on one corner that are medieval, but mm -hmm. all the rest then is is going centuries later, and quite a bit of it's Victorian, when... when if anyone who knows England and Wales pretty well, is that the Victorians went through and made an absolute mess of quite a lot of things, or improved them, depending on your point of view. But uh, <laughs> all the floors and all the woodwork is all Victorian. Um, the okay. the east eastern tower, um, the the designer, the Victorian chap who was looking at the, the remodeling, wanted a, a, a huge spire on the thing. Um, but when I started to do some of the work, realised that the, the foundations weren't up to it and it started to subside. So they, they gave up mm -hmm. on the idea. Um, but it's not a grand cathedral like um, Canterbury or, or York Minster or any. No, no. But, it, but I know you've been yeah. there, Jeff. It's um, it's friendly enough. I've enjoyed your pictures, too, on Facebook. That's great. I'd love, you know, yeah. love to see them. Yeah, we do put them up occasionally. Anyway, chaps, I'm going to probably pull the plug in a minute.
Jeff, you're more, you're more than welcome to come in at any other point when there's a talk that you think you might be interested in. Just we might even get you as a signed up member one day of the of the society. <laughs> I, I I would be open to that. Yes, yeah, so well, it's not an expensive one to join for the year, is it, lads? We're letting to get to renewal time, and and uh, <laughs> you know we're trying to do a bit more active operating as we go. But um, it's nice to have a monthly get together with a few of us, and it's nice to see Ian. Uh, Ian's not had a camera before, have you, Ian? Not oh, but I don't use it. I just don't use it. No, it's fine. You know, <laughs> we could hear you normally. Yeah. Um, you know, I think you've only been on once before, anyway. So. Yeah, I'm I'm in the back room where all the junk is. So the wife keeps saying, "Well, don't don't sit that way. Don't face that way." Still... <laughs> yeah, make sure that the certain box titles can't be seen because I don't know how good the camera is and how well people can zoom in. So is a, a Bush just... radio on there is it? It's an old yeah, it's a Deck Ninety Eight that I rebuilt. Yeah. Nice. Nice, yeah. But, uh, Ten a penny. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've noticed about a lot I'll of... I'll see you from there. <laughs> oh, yeah, second. Good of you. I bet you have. But I didn't notice about since over the last two years of this pandemic and a lot of people on the news broadcasts are at home, aren't they? So you're interviewing a professor or whatever and, and they're at home or in the office. And it's always interesting to see what's on the bookshelf behind because that seems to be the thing. You can't sit... You know, in the corner where you've got your bowl of sweets or your bag of crisps or whatever, they have to <laughs> yeah. be in front of a bookcase so they look like books, books, and yeah. the latest book is sort of prominently displayed with the cover showing, <laughs> so you can actually see what it is. Yeah, yeah. You know, I know what I'm talking about. Here's the book I wrote about it in the background. <laughs> yeah. <and all> yeah. <laughs> anyway, look, gentlemen, and nice to see Roland. He looks he looks tired tonight, but um, it's nice to see you all. Um, thank you for supporting it. We, we, we've got another meeting on the. Hmm, Last Friday of the month, at the 25th? Yeah, 25th, which will be about the, um, which will be Steve uh, Shorey coming to talk about the, the, the KW company. So some of that's, Kate, you know, it's quite an interesting story. And of course it's founder, Roly, she Roly Shears, wasn't it? Uh, G8KW, yeah. Who was also a member of the Deutsche Amateur Radio Club. Member number one. Oh, <laughs> He's member number one. He might even touch on this because after the he'd been in um, over there, you know, worked on communications, but ended up in Germany just at the end of the war, working in the army. I forget his exact role, but he persuaded the powers that be that they should restart amateur radio as some of the process of regaining a normal, you know, sort mm. of lifestyle, etc. And because he got them the permission. The DARC gave him membership number one in, in, in recognition of his work to re-establish amateur radio in, in Germany, which was quite interesting. And I think it's going to be very, you know, we all know there's trouble in Europe at the minute. And you see that QRZ.com as a website, for instance, taking all the Russian call signs off. So you, you, could, you could work a Russian station if you want to at the minute, but you can't look them up if they have a QRZ page because they're not showing them. And I see, did you see the RSGB statement about it today as well? I forget the exact wording, but um, the, the German, Russian and Belarusian stations cannot actually enter RSGB contests for the moment. And if you work one in a contest, they won't be added to the points tally. I always thought we were apolitical, but maybe I'm being a bit naive on, in that terms. Well, I think the whole world's turned against uh, Putin and what they've done. Well, and I, I Even can, China. That's the weird thing. Yeah, yeah. I can understand that, uh, Stuart, and I, I agree that in many respects that should happen. But people sat at home enjoying their hobby I, who have no say in anything that goes on. I just find it slightly bizarre, but that's maybe I'm, I'm probably just very naive and I probably I really am. But um, it's such a shame that uh, something that we're so apolitical, non-political, that we're getting dragged into. What did they used to say, uh, Simon? Go on. All it takes, all it takes, is for a few good men to do nothing. Yeah, and it's, you know we're being sort of uh, negative towards the Russian and Belarus. Yeah, uh, in the hope that they will see sense and talk to their powers of being, say, listen, what you're doing is totally wrong, and yeah, you know, because this is this is only going to get worse. It's going to get so, a lot worse. In this, and well, you know, this is we're not yeah. talking amateur radio now, are we? So apologies, gentlemen, if it offends. But there's um, a million dollar. Um, I saw somewhere a million dollar uh, reward for capturing Putin by one of his oligarchs. 
Really? I saw some, uh, yeah. And let's face it, they need the money now, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> They've lost a fair few quid. We've got it's on the BBC yet, yeah, but yeah. It, I saw it somewhere, so I'm not sure how accurate that news is. But well, if, if, it was, if someone did it successfully, we've got space for him in the Tower of London. <laughs> <laughs> there was a room in the Tower of London with a toilet that was put in. They, they put, Churchill, Churchill had a toilet added to one of the cell, the rooms in the Tower of London for, for Hitler in case we ever uh, captured him. Uh, okay. Because there was no there was no flushing toilets in there, so he had one put in. <laughs> That's not a myth either. I've been on the tour of the Tower of London and I've actually shown the room, which was quite funny. I thought he was going to say you've been on the toilet. Oh no, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to use, you know, Hitler's toilet. Yeah, well, it was there just in case, but um, no, it's it's very worrying times, my friends. So just you know, we're well aware of the trouble here at the moment, unless this thing spreads. But let's just hope that um, some sense of some common sense is found from someone at some point. You'll so, never find any of that. No, well, no, it's just all the poor, <laughs> whatever you know. But it's all the poor souls that have been displaced and and terrified, isn't it? You can only imagine. Um. Makes me grateful that we live on an island a lot of the time over here. But uh, that doesn't make a lot of difference these days either, does it? <laughs> you go. On that thought, I'm going to go now. So yeah, sorry, Ian. Much. I'm, my apologies, Ian. I've been off piece. No, 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 no sorry. No, it's, it's, yeah, we're not going to go. We're not going to say anything that we're going to upset anybody else. And if we do get upset, we're not going to show it. So well, exactly. <laughs> and I'm not. I'm not trying to. Anyway, gentlemen, enough of that nonsense. Okay. Take care of right. yourselves. Yeah. Okay, we'll catch up with you soon. Yeah, Robert, we'll speak, see you on the sixteenth, Robert. We can catch we can catch up properly then, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, lovely. Okay. And um to Andy and uh, Ian, Stuart, Roland, and to Jeff, you're most welcome and hopefully see you again. Okay. Cool. See you right, soon. Oh, good, good night. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.